Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. The car you're looking at right here is, uh, well, it was a labor of love. It was built in 1931 by a 17-year-old kid and rebuilt by us about 12 years ago. Now, if you think you've seen this car before, you probably have. When I started this website about, God, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, this is one of the first vehicles we did, and the video was only two and a half or three minutes long. So we thought we'd go back and uh, kind of revisit it and, and, uh, and show you what it's all about and give you the full story. Um, it says Indian on the side because it uses an Indian engine. Uh, this was built in 1931 by a 17-year-old kid named Bob Shotwell. Uh, that's why it's called the Shotwell. His dad, uh, he told his dad he wanted a car. And his dad said, you know, we don't have any money. You want a car, you're going to have to build it yourself. So he and his dad went down to a junkyard in Minnesota, and they bought some Ford parts, some Model 8 pieces, axles, whatever, and some sheet metal, brought it all home, uh, bought a four-cylinder engine from an Indian motorcycle, and built this three-wheel car. Uh, Bob drove this thing with his brother from Minnesota to Alaska to San Diego, about a 6,000-mile or 8,000-mile trip. In the course of his lifetime, he put 150,000 miles on this thing. Uh, the interesting part is, I never met Bob Shotwell, but I've met a lot of members of his family. Uh, when he was in his uh, late 70s, um, his health was not good. This was sitting in his backyard, just kind of rotting back to the earth. And he was so afraid that some motorcycle guys would ravage it and tear it apart to get the four-cylinder Indian motorcycle engine because that was the most valuable piece of it. He didn't want to see it destroyed. And he'd seen me on TV talking about cars and things like that. So he said, uh, he contacted me. He said, I'll give you this car if you promise to restore it and not sell it. And I said, that's a good deal. So I called Inner City Lines. That's the trucking company you always use. And I sent them up to Minnesota to pick it up. <laughs> and it was kind of a funny story. You know, when you pick up a car, there's a a uh, sheet of paper that shows a picture of a generic car and you check off where it was damaged. Well, this guy just said every piece of this was damaged. <laughs> he says we could not damage this vehicle anymore. It was dented and rusted and rotted out. It was really, really in, ba <laughs> in bad shape. And when I got it here, the guy said, this is my easiest job ever because I didn't have to worry about scratching it or anything because it's in such bad shape. Uh, the engine at the time when we pulled it out was completely exhaust, just completely worn out. Pistons, cam, everything. We did the crank, we did the pistons, we, uh, uh, we did everything we had to do to get this thing running again. And we did some updates on it, which I'll show you in, in, a, in, in a few minutes. The interesting thing to me was that this was built by a 17-year-old by himself in 1931. I don't know many 17-year-olds that could build a car like this today. You know, this was before video games, before television, maybe you had a radio. And I think a lot of young guys uh, back in that period, just for lack of nothing to do, you, you, you learn to put projects together. You know, I've got a book called um, Projects for Boys. It was written in like 1927. And oh my God, the projects are so complicated. How to make a radio how to make an electric garage door opener for your dad. How to, I mean, things I don't know many adults could build, but it was expected that when you were a young man of uh, 12 or older back in, the, back in the 20s and 30s, you were expected to know how to use tools, how to shoot guns, how to fix guns, how to clean guns, how to do all kinds of things like that. You know, So it's fascinating that uh, Bob could build this car by himself. It, it cost him $300. It took him two, three years to finish it. And he was quite proud of it. Um, he went on to be a pilot for Northwest Airlines. Uh, so he was a true engineer, but he never lost his love uh, for this little car. Um, there's some aircraft influence in here. For example, this here is the uh, gas gauge. You see there's a float in there, and this bobs up and down. And uh, when, the, when it's all the way down, <laughs> you're out of fuel. So you just kind of keep your eye on that while you're driving. If it's bouncing off the hood, well, then uh, the float is sunk and you're, uh, you're out of fuel. That's kind of interesting. Uh, there were spare wheels on each side. We cleaned that up and did that away with it. But before we get into it and open it up, let me show you uh, some of the pictures 
that Bob took back in the day. Come on, follow me. This is sort of the micro section of the garage, all the cars that are under a couple of liters or whatever, uh, the Honda, uh, the Topolino, the Midget, and of course the, uh, the other Morgan. This is where the, uh, this is where the shot well lives when it's not being driven. And we've got some memorabilia on the wall here that's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a picture of Bob right there when he finished the car. He's pretty proud of this thing. And look at those long legs. He was a big, tall guy. This is what it looked like maybe 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Pretty rough, but apparently still running. But as you can see, dented and smashed in every corner. A lot of body rot here. Um, this is an article I wrote in 2006 for Popular Mechanics called Remembering a Man I Never Met. And it, it's fascinating just to kind of admire a guy that you really didn't know a lot about. I just liked his engineering skills and the fact that he went on to be a pilot for Northwest Airlines and was a very successful guy. It's that sort of greatest generation group of guys, you know. Here he is demonstrating his car, how light it is. Look at those long legs. Look at just picking the car up. This is his original sketch of what the car would look like when he finished it. As you can see, it's very 1930s Art Deco streamlined, kind of cool looking thing. Uh, here's his engineering ideas, is the engine and the chassis, built all that himself. Subframe, look at this. This is before obviously the body was on. And this is what it looked like after it was done. As you can see, there are two spare wheels here. We got rid of those because I don't really, uh, plan on drive to Alaska anytime soon. I just kind of go around the block. You know. But uh, it, it's pretty neat. There I am sitting in it right there. Uh, it's a little cramped to get into, but once you're in, it's okay. I mean, to think that Bob put 150,000 miles on this thing <laughs> is, uh, is pretty amazing. So this is our little shot well corner. Um, it's always fun when some of their family members come by every couple of years and they want to see the pictures and they're here for them to take a look. Come on, let's get back to the car. Now we did quite a few improvements to the vehicle. Uh, when Bob built it, it did not have an electric starter. Let me show you how this works. This is how you open up the side of the engine. Uh, undo this here. Put this little... This was his idea. Trouble is, if you stall this in traffic, you had to get out. Uh, take this off, lift this up, and kickstart the thing, which uh, in LA traffic doesn't really work. So we put an electric starter on it. We put a modern alternator on it. Uh, Bob very cleverly had some fans up here, electric fans to blow air down to the cylinders. Uh, we realized uh, Minnesota's a lot cooler than uh, LA in many ways, besides the temperature. So we put a more high performance fan in there. We sealed it off so it would blow throughout the fins because the first time we drove this thing in LA traffic, it was so hot, I go, I smell acid. Well, the battery had melted because it got so hot in here. So, okay, well, you can't do that. Um, we got rid of the uh, Indian carburetor that was on there and put that SU. Uh, what else did we did? This is all his. See the spring here? Kind of the mono shock, very interesting. You see this wheel here? This is just off like a shopping cart. The idea is if you blow a tire, it won't tip over on you. It'll fall about two inches and the, the, this wheel will catch the pavement. So if you go around a corner and the tire blows, you won't go down, which I think is uh, pretty clever. Um, oh, we also put a modern electric fuel pump in it because it was just too much trouble before. But other than that, it's pretty much the way Bob built it. But as I said, the engine was completely worn out. Uh, it's about 77 cubic inches, about uh, 40 horsepower, and it goes down the road okay. We actually take this on the freeway, as stupid as that sounds. Let me shut this here. As I said under here we have our gas tank. Uh, before you, you have to take the ball off, you see, like that, and press that down, and uh, there we go. And there's a little bit of storage in there. We got our horn, so here's a, here it is here. This is your gas tank. Um, so you can, uh, there's actually more room in this than there is in my McLaren, okay? So the P1 has less space than this, so might be something from the McLaren engineers to think about. 
Okay, let's put this back. Then you want to put your little orange ball back on there again. Don't want your hood flying off at high speed. Imagine driving this from Minnesota to Alaska to San Diego. I mean, it really was a different time, you know. The fact that a 17-year-old kid could build a car, go down to the Department of Motor Vehicles and register it, and they walk out and they go, the horn work, lights work, brakes work. Okay, there you go. You got your own car. You know, it was called the Shotwell. And I thought he actually did a pretty good job. It's a nice looking car. Got the kind of full radiator in front here. Um, no roll up windows. You need these mirrors here because you can't see out the back. Here's your air intake to cool it. It's got the uh, a three speed transmission. Uh, and you'll see it goes, it goes pretty good. I mean, nobody has any idea what this thing is. Okay, you don't want to get hit by an SUV. I, I, I admit that. But other than that, it runs and drives pretty nicely. Yeah, let's take a look at the interior. This is my rear view mirror. You see, I, I wet this and I stick it on here and then I can adjust it while I'm driving. But I'll show you how that works in a minute when we go for a ride. But it's got, uh, it's got leather interior. We've made a few updates. We've got some aircraft gauges in it, but I'll show you those when we're going down the road. Uh, the brakes are mechanical, which means uh, there's no hydraulics involved. It's just wires <laughs> pulling against the brake. And it's, it stops. It goes okay. Um, you know, she'll do 60, 65 on the freeway, which is hysterical. People go by and they go, what, what, what is that thing? Because from the back, it really looks kind of funny. But... Um, as I said, 17 year, years old, 80 years ago, pretty amazing. You know, it's fun. His family has stopped by here a couple of times, his wife Peggy and some of the family members to look at the car. And uh, they get a real kick out of it. You know, they've seen, uh, they saw the original video, so hopefully they'll see this one too. And uh, I think they take a certain amount of pride that it was their grandfather or uncle or brother-in-law, whoever, you know, whatever the relationship was. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it's pretty cool that back in 1931, you could build your own car, name it after yourself, go down and get it registered as a shot well, and yeah, that was fine. I think those days are pretty much gone forever, but uh, it was a different time. Come on, let's take it for a ride. Okay, here's the starting procedure for starting this thing. First, you lick the back of your mirror, and then you stick it on here like this. Then you can go, oh, there's people behind me. All right, let's go through everything. This is your horn right here. Okay, that's your uh, tachometer, that's your voltmeter, that's your clock, that's your oil pressure, that's your speedometer, that's your cylinder head temperature, and this is your oil temperature here. Okay, this is your, uh, this is your um, advance and retard, and this is your choke back here. Um, let's get ready to start it. Turn the key. And turn your fuel on underneath. Okay. Full advance. That's choke out. Choke in. Three-speed gearbox. There's no reverse, so you have to get out and push it around corner. If you have to back up, that's kind of a pain. But other than that, we're ready to go. Let's take this baby for a spin. Let's go to Alaska, just like Bob did. signals. My horn just gave up the ghost. 
don't know what happened there. Okay. like the Morgan three-wheeler, there's a, a pothole or a bump in the road. If you don't hit it with the outer wheel, you'll hit it with the inner wheel. So you really can't avoid any obstacles. I'm running awful hot. I want to pull over for a minute up here. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, the fans cut out for some reason. What do we got here? Uh. Uh. Yeah, fans not rolling. Let's see. Maybe blew a fuse. I'm trying to remember where the fuse box is. Let's see, okay. Yeah, but the fan's not working, it'll overheat. It's like not having any water in your radiator. Fan's not going right, you can hear it, right? I heard something click on, but... That's the fuel pump. If I got headlights, check a look. Let's see, electrical problem. Connectors look good. Battery's fine. There's no fuse in the fan. Let me see if there is. I don't know what will cause it to blow. And continue motoring. That was our problem. I blew the horn a couple of times and it didn't blow anymore and I thought, okay, I'll do adjustment on the horn. Well, it's wired up to the same fuse as the uh, fans. But when the fans stop working, the cylinder head gets too hot. Now she's running nice and cool. There's nothing like the satisfaction you get from fixing a problem on the road. So here we got the camera crew. And now it broke down and what happened? That's why I've got this cylinder head temperature gauge. Without that, I never would have 
just a little fuse and that uh, blew the fan which uh, caused the cylinder to heat up a little bit but she's okay now we'll go back to the garage I'll put a new fuse in that we'll we'll try and figure out why that fuse blow in the first place probably because I was blowing the horn a bunch of times and there are a bunch of kids there and I probably uh, showing off it's always a problem come on let's head back to the shop Okay, I figured out what happened here. You know, I'd say four or five years ago, I blew a fuse, and I think we put an eight amp fuse in there because I didn't have a 20. And I just, uh, so driving around now, I saw a bunch of kids, you saw them, I was blowing the horn. I beeped it too many times, it pulled too much amperage, blew the fuse, not just blew that. So now we'll take it inside and we'll put a proper 20 amp fuse in like I should have done four or five years ago, but I didn't have any at the time. So that's what it is. So. It's kind of fun when these problems happen during the shooting of the video. I was driving this around last week. I had no problem, but because I was showing off and hitting the horn. Okay, I did it too many times, and the horn died. And I went, okay, I didn't realize I'd blown the fuse, which is also connected to the blower fan, and that's why we started to overheat. But having my gauges, that's why you always want to check your gauges. That's why gauges are always better than idiot lights. Lights come on after stuff is burned out or overheated. This kept climbing and climbing. I thought, why isn't it cooling? And uh, that's what it was. We blew the fuse. So now we're okay. So problem solved. <laughs> See you next week. Bye-bye.